between you and your brother, who's the evil twin? I'd say my brother is the evil twin, for sure. And he'd probably say that I am. <laughs> probably bull my first paying job was a uh, stock boy at Pep Boys, the automotive store, in the summer before I went to college in 1992. was the death penalty. There's a lot of evidence over the last 20 years that people have been put on death row that should not have been there. They have been exonerated. And it makes you wonder, over the years, before we had DNA evidence, how many people might have been put to death that didn't deserve it. What actor should play me in my biopic? There's this actor, Billy Crudup, if anybody remembers him. I don't want to be a cold, sarcastic, blocked off man anymore. People often describe me as very cautious. If people look at my record, it's actually a record of taking some risk. The best example of that was taking my entire mayoral tenure on trying to get the people of San Antonio to raise the sales tax in order to expand high quality full day pre-K. Of course, we were in Texas, and so people don't like raising taxes, but I felt that that was key to improve its educational achievement. I felt like it was the right thing to do and that I was willing to risk losing that. And fortunately, it worked out. It passed with 53% of the vote. And because of that, today, San Antonio has one of the strongest pre-K programs in the nation. The first time that I met Barack Obama, actually before he became president, in the summer of 2008, he was just a groundbreaking candidate that represented history in the making. And he hadn't gotten elected yet, but already he was somebody that was special. And for me, it was really neat to meet him. It was an odd criticism because the program that they cited was around for years before I got to HUD. And then when I got to HUD, I was actually the one that said that we need to change it and improve it. And we did improve the program. Even the critics of the program recognized that by the time the Obama administration ended, it was a better program because of the improvements that had been made under my tenure. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten emails that say go back to Mexico. In public service, I've seen the bigotry that still exists out there. I think all of us see that too oftentimes, whether it's on Twitter or in other ways in our daily lives now that everybody has a cell phone camera and people capture the interaction a lot more between neighbors or just people interacting in public. My worst habit is definitely overchecking my phone. If you have the iPhone, you know that you get an uh, update every week now with the latest model on how many hours you've used your phone every week. So it's seven hours and one minute of screen time, which was down 12% from last week. And that was probably down 20% from the week before. <laughs> I'm getting better. <laughs> I felt like an addict like two or three weeks ago, but this is not too bad. I'm on Twitter most of the time when I'm, you know, on my phone. My wife, Erica. I've been married to my wife now almost for 12 years. In about a month, my wife and I are gonna celebrate the 20th anniversary of our first date, which was on May 26, 1999. She's been a wonderful wife and a wonderful mother to our two children, Karina, who's 10, and Christian, who's four. I know that I couldn't do this campaign or this journey in life that we've been on without her. Every candidate should have to answer whether they're gonna take any PAC money, whether they're gonna take any federal lobbyist money, and how they would make government in Washington more transparent. I'm not taking any federal lobbyist money. I'm not taking any PAC money. Congressman Tim Ryan wants to ask all of the candidates, how are you gonna fix the economy in a way that cuts workers in on the deal? That's a great question. I would start by raising the minimum wage. We haven't raised the minimum wage in a decade. We need to get it up to $15 an hour. I would also appoint people to the National Labor Relations Board and other boards that understand the value of labor, of unions, to ensure that we have a strong middle class. And I would invest in affordable housing because it's not just about how much money somebody takes home, it's also about whether they can afford basic things like food and rent. Over the last 
few decades, the rent has been going up and up. And today, too many families pay more than 40 or 50 or 60 percent of their income in rent. And so I would tackle this on both ends, how much people make and then how much we invest so that they can do things like afford to live in a decent, safe place. That's what friends are for. <laughs> if anybody remembers the 80s song. It depends, you know, sometimes I sleep for seven hours, sometimes I sleep for four hours. Last night I think I slept for three hours, but usually it probably works out to like between, you know, five and six hours. There's no question that uh, you have tremendously talented people in this field, including tremendously talented women. And uh, it's a breakthrough year with a number of women who are running. It's also a very special year, 2020. We're gonna mark 100 years of suffrage for women. And I think that it's fitting. What I'm doing on my part is just presenting my own ideas, and what I believe about the future of this country and my experience and what I would do if I'm president. When I was the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, one of the things that we built up from scratch was this partnership between housing authorities, internet service providers, and nonprofits to deliver either free or very, very low cost internet service, broadband, to families living in public housing because we found that the vast majority of families living in public housing didn't have internet access at home. And that was in 2015. Thousands of families have since joined that program. And because of that, there are children out there that are able to learn better, to keep up with their homework. There are parents who are able to apply for a job more easily. That's an example of something that is helping to improve the lives of young people and of their parents, and I'm very, very proud of that. My mom was in many ways my role model. I wouldn't be in politics, I don't think, if it hadn't been for growing up in a household with a mother who was super involved in the old Chicano movement, who gave me a sense that participating in the democratic process was a good thing. I grew up with this sense that even though you're not always going to get what you want, and we we're coming from a history of being on the outside, and trying to fight for more civil rights, I grew up with this sense that it was worth participating in. And you can draw a straight line from my mother's activism to my actually going into politics. And also, uh, you know, she, she just gave me, a, I think, a very sturdy foundation as a parent aside from her activism. She's a wonderful mother to Joaquin and to me. It would be climate change because it represents an existential threat, not only to the United States, but to our planet. We need our young people to come out this year because nobody has a greater stake in the future than somebody who's 18 years old, 25 years old. You're gonna to have to live with the consequences of all the decisions that we make well into the future, whether it's on climate change or our economy or student loans. It's been so inspiring to see young people like those Parkland students get involved or dreamers who have protested and have pushed for better immigration policies. I hope that folks will take a page from all of them, get as active as possible and vote in 2020. <laughs> Maybe this thing's lying to me. Maybe it's just like, you know.